Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for joining today. We are so excited to have you for our last fall Kentucky Master Naturalist um, Zoom webinar. And um, today we are joined by Kendall McDonald, who is a botanist and lichenologist with the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. Kendall, it is such a pleasure to have you on today. Thank you. Yeah, I'm super glad to be here. Super okay. excited to talk about lichens. So I am a lichen, your uh, topic and presentation. I had to get like one pun in, you, you know, I, just one, just one. Um, and, you know, just a delight to have you on. Lichens are so interesting and they surround us no matter where we are, you know, in urban areas, in the woods, all over the place. But I think a lot of times um, we have lichen blindness, maybe. We don't really notice them. Or if we do, we maybe think they're fungi or they're just, you know, leaves or something. Um, so I'm really excited to learn a little bit more about this with you. So Kendall is originally from Owenton, Kentucky, and she went to Moorhead State University for her undergraduate, where she got a degree in biology. Um, she also conducted independent research during this time on no surprise, lichens. Um, so even then, you know, real passion for this topic. Um, immediately following that, she started working for the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. And since then, has been involved with a really wide range of projects. So definitely lichens, as well as mosses, but even, you know, leading the um, forest assessment program there. So a really diverse range of expertise and skill sets. She also has a new program for all those master naturalists who are joining. If you're looking for volunteer hours, a great new Adopt a Rock House program starting at the Red River Gorge this fall that you'll hear more about. Um, so lots of, uh, you know, great resources that you bring to our remote table here today uh, and expertise to share. So thanks again for joining us. And go ahead and take it away and share your slides. And if you have any questions for Kendall, you can put those in the chat um, or in the Q and A, and I'll raise those when we get to the when we get to breaks in her presentation or at the end. All right, hi everybody. Um, just a quick plug for that Adopt a Rock House program. Um, I will uh, at least towards the end of this presentation send a link. Um, to the article about uh, the program in the uh, Native Plant Society's Lady Slipper um, newsletter. So you guys can read about that. And <clears throat> in that we'll also have the contact information if you'd like to apply to be a volunteer and help us um, monitor the cliff line communities and rock houses of the Red River Gorge. So um, before we get started, uh, if you guys see me looking down a lot, I'm at home of just my laptop. So I have all my notes for this SLISO presentation on my phone. So um, I am paying attention. I'm just making sure I don't miss anything. Um, and if you hear any rambunctious animal noises in the back, I have a very um, hyperactive cat named Luna uh, who sometimes uh, gets a little jealous when I talk on the screen and I'm not paying attention to her. So hopefully she'll be good, but Sometimes she's not, but she's cute, so it's fine. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my presentation with you guys. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started into Lichens 101. First, I have to uh, go over some things about my agency. This is all of our statutes written out, but nobody likes to read words. So let's look at some pictures to explain these things. So um, the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserve conserves over 150 properties uh, consisting of more than 120,000 acres across the state. You can see it broke down here, the different types of properties we own and work with. Um, we do a lot of different kinds of management and invasive treatments, prescribed fire, uh, hemlock woolly adelgid uh, treatments, uh, invasive removal. We're very heavily involved in management of our properties and with partners' properties. We do lots of biological um, assessments. Basically, if it's alive in Kentucky, we take data on it. Um, we have a great, uh, very, very skilled staff uh, who are skilled and experienced in a wide variety of biological topics. 
And then of course we do stuff like this, environmental education and outreach. We do volunteer days, um, lots of different things just to get the community and the public involved with all this great natural um, biodiversity we have here in the state. Uh, we have our um, KBAT, which is our natural, um, our, our Kentucky biological assessment tool. Um, if you ever want to get any of our data, you can <clears throat> uh, request it through this uh, tool online. It's super easy and user-friendly to use. Um, and you can contact me later after this presentation if you want any more info on that. Okay. So we'll go ahead and get into our subject matter for the day. Um, what are lichens? So this, I know we're all adults here and um, you know these stories are kind of for little kids, but this is a great way to help yourself remember uh, what lichens are and a really great teaching tool. You can find this story online if you don't remember it, um, if you're ever teaching about lichens or talking to someone about them. Um, so we're gonna gather around the campfire together for a little story time. So lichens start with the story of Alice Algae and Freddie Fungus. Freddie Fungus was an excellent carpenter, but he wasn't a good cook. In fact, he couldn't even make his own food. Just like all fungi, he had to learn, he had to search for dead plants or animals to eat. And sometimes he went hungry. One day, while Freddy Fungus was looking for food, he followed a tempting aroma to a rundown house. Inside was the cook responsible for the delicious smell, Alice Algae. Seeing an opportunity to trade his skills for food, Freddie Fungus offered to fix up her house and Alice Algae agreed. After spending a lot of time together, Freddie Fungus and Alice Algae inevitably took a lichen to each other. And from then on, Freddie Fungus would build the house and Alice Algae would make the food. And they lived happily ever after. So Alice and Freddie may have been in love but the scientific word for this kind of relationship is symbiotic. In a lichen, the algae provides the food through photosynthesis and the fungus provides the structure. And what's really interesting is that this isn't just a big mass of fungal cells and algal cells. It's actually really organized um, within the organism. So on the right here, there is a um, photograph taken um, on a microscope by my uh, advisor from Moorhead State, Dr. Alan Risk. And um, you can see here that it has a layering, kind of like a cake. We have an upper cortex at the top um, and those, it's kind of protective. It's a very thin layer of very tightly packed together dense fungal cells. Um, and right beneath it, you have the algal layer the algal layer is always right underneath the upper cortex because it needs to be able to access um, sunlight. Uh, so it can't really be under a lot of fungal layer um, or it wouldn't get sunlight and therefore wouldn't be able to do photosynthesis. Right below that, we have the actual fungal layer. Um, it's also called the medulla. Um, so this, these are more loosely packed fungal hyphae um, that aren't very dense at all. And then underneath we have uh, uh, the lower cortex, which is the same kind of cells as the upper cortex. Um, and again, just provide structure and protection. So lichens have several different growth forms um, and interesting way they get their coloration. So to really understand um, the differences <clears throat> between lichen growth forms, you have to go down to the microscopic and that can be kind of tedious, make your eyes cross. Um, so instead of making you look at really tiny micrographs, um, I made these drawings, uh, which are, I think, e easier to digest. <clears throat> these drawings are not to scale, they're just, you know, to facilitate understanding of how these different um, layers work within different growth forms of lichen. Um, 
So these are all of them together side by side so you can compare, but we'll go over them individually. Um, what's universal about these drawings is that the gray will always be the substrate. So that's whatever um, surface the lichen is growing on. So that's not a part of the lichen. It's um, just what it's growing on. The dark orange will be cortex. So that's our tightly packed, dense fungal cells that are providing structure and protection. Um, the green will be our algal layer with our algae. And then this light tan will be our fungal layer. So the, uh, I wouldn't say the most common, but one of the most noticed uh, growth forms of lichens are folios lichen. So one way to remember this is folios, foliage. It's leaf-like, it's lobe-like. You can, you know, see them kind of pro proliferate out in these leafy-like lobes. Um, you should be able to really easily separate uh, that lichen from its substrate with, you know, your hand or even a knife or a little chisel um, without a lot of work. Uh, you don't have to take any of the substrate with the lichen um, when you take it off of its substrate because, you know, it could just be easily separated. If we go down to the microscopic, if you look up in the top right corner, we have our little drawing. What's happening um, microscopically that makes this distinct is that these will always have a distinct upper and lower cortex. So, you know, you'll, you can flip them over. There's a top and there's a bottom um, and they're very, they're different from one another. They're distinct. They're usually different colors. Um, they might have different features. Uh, so that's one way you can always tell if it's a folios lichen. Our next growth form we're going to talk about are crustose. Um, again, crustose, they look like crust. They're crusty. Um, so these lichens, they look painted on to the surface. Um, there's definitely not a lot of lobes going on. Um, and they're very, very oppressed. Uh, you might not even recognize that there is a lichen there sometimes. And that's because they actually grow within the surface of their substrate. And because they grow into the surface of their substrate, they don't have a lower surface, really. They don't have any lower cortex. Um, so that fungal layer will just take its fungal hyphae and slowly push its way into the surface of the substrate. Sometimes some lichens can use different chemicals to break down the substrate and push into it. Others just use sheer force of time um, and pressure. So that is our crustose lichens. Our showy lichens, these are the ones that everybody always takes pictures of and sends to me um, because they're bigger, um, they're showy, they're easy to spot, um, they're beautiful. Everybody loves a fruticose lichen. Um, so these are fruticose and I try to think when I teach people, I'll say fruticose is like a fruit tree. You know, it has branching, it, you know, it's shrubby. It can be pendant, it can be erect, it's got all of this branching. Um, and one interesting thing is like a crustose lichen, this doesn't have um, a distinct upper and lower surface. And that's just because um, fruticose lichens, <clears throat> the structure is more like a tube instead of being layered. Um, so there is no upper cortex and lower cortex, there's just cortex all around. Um, so it's just all one layer because it's usually more of a tube structure. So if you look up at the drawing in the upper right hand corner, you can see um, how that's different. <clears throat> and the last uh, growth form that we will go over is squamulose. So uh, we'll talk about the little drawing in the upper right hand corner first. Uh, if you look at that, it looks kind of like we took the folios lichen, and I'll go back to that just so you can look. 
in the upper right hand corner, we've got our folios. You know, you've got your orange, green, tan, orange, um, you know, cortex, algal, fungal cortex. So when we go to squamulose, it just looks like we turned a bunch of those on their side and, you know, shrank it down. And that's kind of what it is. When I explain to people what a squamulose lichen is, um, I try to, you know, make it like shingles on a roof. Um, they overlap each other um, and lichens are like a very bad roof job where it's just very messy and kind of all over the place, but they're shingles and they're overlap and only a, you know, sliver of that shingle or that lobe actually touches um, and makes contact with the substrate. So um, in lichen speak, we uh, call these little small lobes, little small scales, um, and they have an upper and lower surface, but they might not all be connected to one another <clears throat> um, in these little small pockets, or they could all connect to one another and be very overlapping. Um, if they are kind of separate from one another, there will usually be a fungal um, layer that kind of unites them all, that kind of goes underneath um, all of these little lobes and scales. Uh, so it's still one organism, even though it might look like several small uh, organisms living apart. They're all still together because they're united by that fungal layer. So lichen colors, um, this is something really interesting that I always uh, get a really big kick out of thinking about. Um, so this picture, uh, these are, this, both of these pictures are the exact same species. Um, and one is just hydrated and one is dehydrated. Uh, this is Loberia pulmonaria, um, the lungwort. Um, I'm sure some of you guys have seen this before. It's a very charismatic and popular uh, lichen. Uh, usually if people know lichens, this is the one they know. Um, so I just wanted to show you guys how different this species can look. Like the one on the right is perfectly healthy. It's not dead. Um, it is just going through something um, and exhibiting a behavior called poik kilohydri. Um, And what that means is, is that this uh, organism can completely dry out. Um, and there've been studies that they can dry out for over 30 days, have no water at all. And the moment they're introduced to an adequate water level, within minutes, they will uh, you know, completely hydrate and begin photosynthesis. Um, as if they, you know, never lost the water at all. And it's, it's so amazing how much the lichens can withstand. Uh, I think it was in 2005, the European Space Agency actually sent lichens into space and exposed them to uh, cosmic radiation and all of the temperature fluctuations um, and the conditions of space for 15 days. And they brought them back down to earth and you know, gave them adequate water. And within minutes, they functioned as if they had never left the planet. Um, so they can really withstand uh, incredible um, environmental conditions, which is part of the reason why lichens can be found on every single continent um, and pretty much in all conditions all over the world. Um, so if you guys have any questions at this point, if you could type them in the chat, um, I'll give you guys a minute and Laurie or Ellen will read them to me and I'll do my best to answer. Um, so I can't see the chat right now. We do my... have one question. Um, are the green leaf looking structures lichens or is the green on the tree bark? I think it's in reference to a recent slide. Um, that, yeah. This slide? Mm -hmm. Can Can you re repeat the question? Are, are the green leaf looking structures lichens or is the green on the tree bark? 
I think she's referring to the the green, the yes, the lichen that's there in the different colors. Um, there's also some moss in that second picture, right? That dehydrated yes. algal layer, but the the bright green thing in that hydrated algal layer, that's a lichen. Yes, yes, that is a lichen. Um, so I I wish I had a video of this. So the photo on the left is from Bad Branch. Um, nature preserve and if you've ever been there it is a very wet place and the fog um, is insane there on a good early morning um, and therefore the lichens there look like this picture on the left where they're very hydrated and very vividly bright green but as soon as you know you get into a place that's more <clears throat> that goes through periods of dryness uh, you get it more looking like what it's looking like on the right which is this whitish tan um, kind of sad uh, dead looking specimen. The green that's around that in the right is uh, just a moss um, and you know nothing green in that photo uh, is lichen. But if you put water on that lichen on the right within two minutes, it's going to look like the lichen on the left. Very cool. Um, we did have a question. How are moss and lichens related? Um, I would say they're really not too related. They're completely um, separate uh, organisms. Um, moss don't have any kind of algal or fungal component to them. They often do grow in the same habitats. Um, because they colonize the same kind of substrates. Um, they can compete with one another even. I've seen that a lot where um, moss will be dying uh, because lichens are out competing it or vice versa. Um, but, you know, it related, uh, you know, evolutionarily, it's, uh, they're pretty much very, very uh, unrelated and they'd have a very, a common ancestor way, 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 way back. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Yeah, one of those great examples of, of <laughs> convergent evolution, you know, things looking similar, doing similar things really differently. Um, uh, another question for you, uh, what types of things can lichens grow on? I'm not going to answer that one yet because I've got several slides coming great. up those through that. All right, then we've got a question um, that maybe is related to it. Why do lichens build up on slow growing trees and not fast growing trees? Oh, I, uh, okay. This is a subject that I get really excited about. <laughs> so lichens cannot handle disturbance. They are very, very slow growing. And I'll talk about how slow growing later. Um, so they cannot take a lot of change. So if it's a very fast growing tree, if you think about the micro scale of the bark on that tree, and at the micro scale, how much that fast growing tree is changing and how much that surface is changing. That's not conducive to a lichen. As that, you know, more bark is produced and that bark stretches and grows, that lichen, it, the baby little lichen that's trying to grow on there is just gonna fall off um, or just not be able to handle it and die. But a slow growing tree, there's not a lot of change that happens um, on the bark surface. So, you know, it's a very safe place for those lichens to um, anchor down and grow for a really long time. So when you're thinking about lichens, you really can't think about like a plant scale or a human scale. You have to really think about the super small uh, micro habitats. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and thanks for those of you who uh, uh, asked some questions. Um, so I think that's all we've got for now. Okay, all right, we'll go on to the next part. Uh, so we're just gonna talk some basic lichen anatomy, um, just so you know everybody knows you know, on a vascular plant, what's a leaf, what's a flower, what's a stem, and things like that. Most people don't know the basics of uh, lichen anatomy. So I would just like to give you guys some tools um, so you can more effectively talk about lichens and learn about them. One thing I always get asked about are the rhizines. Um, you could maybe akin these to roots in vascular uh, plants, but 
you really kind of can't because the only function of a rhizine is to anchor the lichen to its substrate. They don't take up um, <clears throat> any kind of nutrients or water or anything uh, from those rhizines. It's really just about uh, attachment. Um, but everybody seems to think because they look like roots that maybe uh, the lichen is being parasitic upon the, let's say the tree that it's growing on. Um, but really it's just got a lot of tiny little grabby hands um, that it's trying to use to attach to the substrate. Um, and all these are our extensions of that lower cortex we talked about. Um, and because, you know, only folios lichens have um, a lower cortex, you know, they're the only ones that will have rhizines. Um, rhizines, you know, can be super uh, diverse in their structure, in their color, uh, what they look like. Uh, so I, I drew a little drawing up here in the, in the top center where you can see the different kinds of branching you can get um, with rhizines, but we won't go that in depth with it, but just know that that's what those are. Um, and there's lots of literature out there and books and online resources. So if you're ever trying to ID or learn more, um, you can get more into that. Um, this is called pseudocyphele, um, which is a big tongue twisty word for a break in the upper cortex. Um, you will see this on a lot of lichens. Um, it's on a lot of common lichens, which is why I wanted to bring it up. So you'll see these little white dots and it's just a break in the upper cortex and the algal layer is usually missing because it doesn't have the upper cortex above it to protect it. So you're seeing these little white <clears throat> dots and what that actually is, is you're seeing down into the fungal layer. So you're seeing the fungus. And this, okay, these kind of look similar and it can get a little confusing. So maculae, you're also seeing down to the fungal layer. So I've made some little arrows on this drawing and you can see these white lines um, that occur on the surface. And so that those are areas where the algal layer is just missing. Um, and the function of this, I'm not really sure, but some lichens will have these little white lines where the algal layer is just not there, but we've got the upper cortex above it and we've got the fungal layer below. And since there's no layer in between, you're just seeing right through. Um, and so if you got your hand lens and you looked up close um, at this lichen, you would see that there is actually no break um, on the upper surface. Um, so that's how you can tell the difference between maculae and pseudocyphele. So this is a, a set of structures that are unique to fruticose lichens, um, but fruticose lichens are the ones that people, you know, really pay attention to since they're so showy. So I figured um, I would go ahead and go over those with you guys. So we usually have at the bottom squamules. So squamules, you'll probably realize that that sounds like squamulose, one of the growth forms that we talked about, the ones that um, I kind of akin to shingles um, on a roof. So all fruticose lichens will usually have a set of squamules that is on the bottom and by the substrate. Um, you can also call this the primary thallus. Um, so these species will have this primary thallus of squamules, and then they will have a um, upright, branching, erect, shrubby, um, secondary thallus that includes a stalk or a branch um, that is called a padisha, and then if you know the right conditions occur um, and you know they can produce uh, sexually, uh, it will have usually somewhere on the padisha 
apothecia, which is a uh, sexual structure. Um, so most fruticose lichens will have the primary and secondary uh, thallus uh, with these three different components. Of course, there are exceptions because of the vast uh, diversity of lichens, but these are some basic uh, fruticose anatomy. So are there any questions about what we just went over? So we did have one question, and if you have others, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, are lichens more prevalent now to de decrease levels of sulfur dioxide since coal plants use scrubbers? I have seen new colonies on trees that are 25 to 50 years old. Do you want to hold that for later, either way? <laughs> um, no, I can go ahead and talk about that. Um, I personally don't have, I haven't read anything about the exact thing that you're talking about, but I can speak on a related note that lichens are super sensitive to any air pollution at all. Um, so, you know, I've done air quality um, monitoring with lichens and since lichens take in all of their nutrients um, from the air, they have no protection. It all just comes through their surface. So anything that's in the air will go into a lichen and they also have a habit of concentrating anything that comes into their thallus. So if there's any kind of pollutant in the air, um, it will be concentrated within the thallus just because of the nature of the organism. Um, and eventually when it gets to a certain level, it will kill that lichen. Um, so if there are decreased levels of air pollution in an area, um, it would make sense that lichens would um, make a comeback because they can finally survive the levels of pollution um, in the area. Great, we had one other question. How do the non fruticose lichens reproduce? Um, I'm going to put a pin in that one because we're getting ready to talk about lichen reproduction. Great. Sounds good. Any other questions? I don't see any. Um, I think you're good to go on to the next section. Okay, great. So lichen reproduction. Um, making lichen babies. So lichens can produce um, Asexually and sexually, we will go over asexual reproduction first. Um, the first method they use is um, through this structure called ceridia. Um, and all ceridia are, are algal cells loosely held together with fungal filaments. Um, so I've kind of made some more drawings um, on the right here. This tan um, circle with the green circles in the middle are is going to represent um, a ceridia. And a lichen will produce these ceridia usually on their upper surface in these really loose powdery, um, well, they can be anywhere from powdery to kind of like sandy, grainy um, mounds. Um, and so basically you have little loose lichen babies just hanging out, ready, ready to, you know, be transported to a different substrate. So ceridia, because they're so light and powdery, um, usually are transported by water or wind because um, they're very easily carried off due to their light weight. Uh, so let's say a really strong storm comes through, um, the wind's blowing like crazy and a, <clears throat> tree with some lichens on it with some ceridia ready to go flies off and flies on to another uncolonized tree which will be our new substrate so it'll obviously take a lot of time but since that you know new substrate now has a little bit of the fungal filament and a little bit of the algal um, component it now has everything it needs you know to make a completely new lichen um, on that new substrate. Obviously it'll take a lot of time, um, but eventually a lichen will start to grow on that new substrate. Another um, 
method of asexual reproduction, uh, some species will make these isidia. Um, so isidia are basically algal cells wrapped tightly by fungal filaments, which is very much like our ceridia, but Ascidia have an extra level of protection. It has a cortex covering. <clears throat> so remember that cortex um, is our protective, tightly packed fungal cells. Um, so it's just another extra layer of fungal cells that um, just protect it more and make the lichen able to withstand uh, some rougher, more mechanical dispersal. Um, I to describe what they look like, I always say that they look like creepy little fingers um, reaching up off of the surface. And I've uh, pointed to some of them on uh, these red arrows with this uh, picture on um, the left. So mechanical dispersal of lichens is usually done um, by an insect or a snail, a slug, <clears throat> something like that. So thank you to uh, Shelby Fulton for this beautiful picture of this snail for my slide. Um, but a snail, you know, will come onto a lichen, you know, have a little munch munch, a little snack. Um, and while it's on there, these, you know, acidia, they're like little fingers. So they're just these little brittle, little things sticking up that are meant to be broken off. So as a snail climbs over, it'll probably break off a couple of ascidia. And as it, you know, travels down the tree or up the tree or, you know, wherever it's, you know, crawling around, um, eventually those ascidia that got stuck to it will fall off onto a new substrate. And again, over time, um, that the new substrate has the fungal element and the algal element and over some time, it can go ahead and grow an entire uh, new lichen. So um, the last way that lichens can reproduce is sexually um, through apothecia. So apothecia are these usually most commonly disc or globular structures. Um, that are surrounded by, you know, they have all the different elements of the lichen, the fungal and the algal, but only the fungal part of uh, a lichen will produce, uh, I'm sorry, reproduce sexually. So they will use their apothecia, just like a fungus would, um, to make and spread spores. So I've got another little drawing for you. Uh, here. So you can see these little pink, purple um, ASCO spores I've made that are generally kind of flask shaped. You can see they're round the bottom and they kind of had a narrowing towards the top. And then they'll have fungal cells all in them and they'll be uh, within the uh, apothecia surface. So what do these really look like? Um, I took a photograph of a microscope slide that I made. I took an apothecia and sliced it very, very thinly um, with, a, <clears throat> with a razor and then put it uh, underneath my compound scope. And this is the highest magnification that my scope will go to. So you can see what an ascospore really looks like. Um, so just imagine this photograph is, uh, you know, just a cross section of that apothecia, and you can see uh, in here are little ascospores with the fungal spores inside of them. And they can look a variety of different ways. There's actually quite a diversity in um, ascospore and fungal spore um, structure and colors. Um, and everything like that, but uh, this is one of the easier ones to see under a microscope and, and visualize. So that's why I picked the ones that kind of look like little grenades. So how do they uh, 
do sexual reproduction. So, you know, just like within fungal, um, fun, I'm sorry, within fungi to release their spores, they usually use pressure. So eventually pressure will build up in the apothecia and these ascospores. And because they had that narrow opening at the top, the pressure builds up and then it'll shoot the spores out and eject them. Um, and hopefully, um, if everything goes as planned, those ejected fungal spores will find their way either to an already established lichen that's growing and it may take over that lichen that's already growing, or it could land on free living algae that is compatible with it to make a new lichen. And so this is where things get kind of interesting in figuring out um, genetic individuals of lichen. Um, because a lot of them, if you, you know, Ceridia or Acidia, um, if that was the origin of that lichen, it's a clone of the specimen that it came from. But if that lichen came from sexual reproduction, um, it could have been an established lichen that was then taken over by a new fungus and made into a different species. Or it could have landed on free living algae and, you know, truly be uh, a new individual. So there's a lot of research going on in this area right now to better understand, um, you know, genetically what is a clone, what is a new individual of lichen. Um, so there's still we're still working to get better answers on that. Um, and genetic studies of lichens just started in 2016. Um, so we're kind of um, in the infancy of that kind of science. Uh, but hopefully within the next, uh, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 years, we will understand these things a lot better. So what do these actually look like? I know I've just given you guys a lot of drawings um, to show you guys what apothecia look like. These are the disc shaped um, apothecia. These are the most common. Um, they look kind of like little jam tarts um, where they'll have, you know, like the margin around it. You can see it could be like your little pastry crust. And then it has a filling um, or a topping um, that is usually a different color um, and is usually a richer color. Um, it's actually called the hymenium, but, uh, you know, it could just be the jam on your tart. So that is, you know, that colorful part in the center are where those ascospores are and where the pressure will build up and eventually that lichen will shoot out its spores. Um, and the second most common kind of apothecia are, are fruticose. Um, apothecia, they will generally have more globular kind of mounds um, as their uh, apothecia structure. Uh, so they kind of look more like this, but they function uh, the same way. They just don't have that margin um, that the disc shaped apothecia have. But these will still, you know, build up pressure and eject spores um, out the same way. Uh, so here's some more photos of different apothecia uh, that occur on a pedicia of fruticose lichens. So do I have any questions about uh, lichen reproduction? You have no questions yet. I don't know if you have any questions, put them in the chat or the Q&A, otherwise we'll just head on. Oh, we do have one question. Do they reproduce at a certain time of year? Um, not that, I have not read any um, research or literature uh, talking about seasonality of reproduction of lichens. I think it's, um, I mean, they're present all the time and I think they can, uh, they just sexually reproduce when conditions are optimal, which is more about um, do we have enough water and can we photosynthesize enough? Um, 
So I don't think it has anything to do with seasonality and more about um, are the conditions where that lichen is optimal for reproduction. Great, thank you. I think that's all for now. Okay. So now we will talk about um, where lichens grow. Um, lichens actually consist uh, of about 7% of the Earth's surface is covered in lichens um, because they can grow in a wide variety of sub, uh, substrates and habitats, um, including some of the most extreme conditions on Earth. Um, so one of the most common places we see uh, lichens is on bark and on wood. Um, so bark, uh, this can get really interesting because all bark's not the same. We know that the chemical, you know, composition of different species of trees, uh, their barks are different. And lichens <clears throat> can sense that and certain lichens are specialists to certain kinds of trees. Um, and then also conifers uh, that tend to be evergreen and have fo foliage all year round, um, they're not as suitable to some lichens because of that foliage kind of keeps the sunlight and the amount of adequate water that that lichen would need to do photosynthesis and survive. So some lichens just can't handle uh, being on like a pine or a hemlock uh, just because they can't get all of the resources uh, that they need. So maybe that lichen would grow on something like an oak. <clears throat> um, and so I, I, dis I distinguish bark and wood because bark is a, um, a living tree um, and some lichens will only grow on bark and living things. And then there are more generalist kind of lichens that will grow on wood. So what I mean by that is dead tree bits. Um, so, you know, a downed tree or a fence someone has made that's, you know, bare wood, not treated. Um, so what's interesting is most lichens that will grow on bark will not grow on wood and vice versa. Um, so there definitely seems to be some kind of distinction uh, between living and dead wood uh, for lichens. <clears throat> So mosses can also, I'm sorry, lichens can also grow on moss. Um, it's usually not very good news for the moss. Um, if a lichen has started uh, growing on it, uh, that usually means that that moss is sickly or something's wrong or um, simply that the lichen is out competing it. Um, and uh, other dead vegetation um, on the bottom left here is a lichen um, that only grows on cedar um, and pine needles that have fallen to the ground that go undisturbed in glades. <clears throat> so lichens can, you know, grow on dead vegetation and then they can even um, grow on living foliage. Um, especially on evergreen, well, in Kentucky, it would really only be rhododendrons that have a uh, big foliage all year round that is conducive to lichens growing on it. Um, so there are some species of lichens that grow on old growth rhodo, um, rhododendron leaves. Um, but if you go, went somewhere like the tropics where they have all kinds of broadleaf evergreen trees, you can, uh, you know, find quite the diversity of lichens growing on those older leaves. So other substrates, rocks and soil. Um, most rock dwelling lichens have really adapted to only inhabit um, a certain kind of rocks, usually uh, something that's more calcareous versus something, you know, that's more like sandstone. Um, so, you know, there's some speciality going out on there. Um, so, you know, if you go to a sandstone outcrop, you're gonna find a completely different lichen flora than if you went to a limestone <clears throat> outcrop. Uh, so that's pretty interesting to me um, that lichens can be so choosy uh, and the communities can be so different. I mean, just like vascular plants. Uh, and then it's kind of the same with soils. 
because uh, you know soil comp composition is different based on the geology underneath of it. Uh, so lichens that will grow in one kind of soil probably won't grow uh, in another kind of soil. Um, lichens will also uh, colonize human-made materials. They do not stop at the natural. Um, they will colonize anything that they can really. Um, so some really interesting parallels that if a lichen will grow on a uh, siliceous rock, it will probably grow on uh, glass. Uh, if it will grow on soil or dead vegetation, it will probably grow on um, cloth. Um, if it will grow on wood, it will <clears throat> probably grow on leather. Uh, and if it will grow on rocks, or if it's just one of our really hardy generalists, it can even grow on metal and plastic. So lichens, really the world is their habitat. Um, they just need time and not a lot of disturbance to do it. Um, they will even colonize the living. Um, animals and insects, they uh, will grow on them. Um, Lacewing larvae, they will produce a sticky silk to attach lichens to them. And then those lichens will actually continue to grow and live on um, that larva. And the larva uses it for camouflage. Um, so it benefits from that. Um, and then to go even beyond that, weevils, there's a species of weevils in New Guinea that have evolved to have specialized texture on their backs that um, you know, will, are really conducive to lichen growth uh, so they can actually grow lichens on their back instead of uh, just finding them and attaching them. So the growth of lichens is something I get asked about a lot. Um, lichens generally grow outward. Um, so all of the new growth you'll see is usually on the outer parts of the lichen and all of the older growth is toward the center. Um, so if you can see in this picture on the right here, you, there's a hole in the center of this lichen and that's because it has started to die. Um, so it will start to die in the center and then kind of die outwards as it also grows outwards. Um, and then you'll get this kind of ring looking structure. Eventually that entire lichen will uh, die because uh, the death is usually slightly faster than the growth, um, but it, you know, it's on a very glacial uh, kind of time scale. So uh, it would take a long time to witness that. Uh, lichens grow really slowly. Uh, it can be anywhere from half a millimeter um, a year to 500 millimeters a year. Um, it just kind of depends on the species. Um, the lifespan of lichens is pretty interesting because they grow at such regular rates. Um, we can age them uh, pretty reliantly. Um, so this lichen, uh, Rhizocarpon geographicum, or the MAC lichen, we don't have this one in Kentucky. Um, I took this photo in Roan Mountain in North Carolina. Um, <clears throat> but this uh, same species also grows in the Arctic and um, they've aged some of the specimens there to be around 8,600 years old. So if, you know, there still needs to be more testing and more analysis done of that. Um, but if that is, you know, correct and, you know, new research confirms this, that would um, make li the, these lichens some of the world's oldest living organisms. So um, another question I get asked a lot are, you know, what are lichens good for? Um, and my response is everything. <laughs> lichens do so much and they don't get enough credit. Um, they're really essential to 
just the balance of entire ecosystems. Um, they do a lot of soil formations. So we talked about, especially crustose lichens growing into the surface of rocks. And, you know, some of them even use chemicals to break down the rocks. <clears throat> so over time, uh, you know, that lichen will break down that rock and die and that rock will become soil. So they're creating soil. There's a lot of lichens that hold the soil together and prevent erosion. Uh, so like this one in the middle uh, prevents a lot of sandstone soil erosion because the fungal hyphae will just proliferate uh, through the soil and really hold it together. Um, tree colonization uh, in some parts of the world, uh, <clears throat> when lichens release water after a rain, um, it actually com really contributes to the humidity and the water levels of the environment um, because the biomass of lichens is so huge in those areas that uh, when they're hit with sun and you know the water begins to evaporate, they actually really affect the climate, well, the local climate and uh, humidity of the area. Uh, lichens hold a huge role in the nitrogen cycle, um, especially the lichens that have blue-green algae in them. Uh, they can fix nitrogen, <clears throat> and then when they uh, die or decay, that nitrogen can be released into the ecosystem. Um, they're food for all kinds of animals, um, most famously caribou and reindeer. Uh, they are nesting material for up to 50 birds so far in North America um, and northern uh, flying squirrels. <clears throat> and then, uh, of course, we talked about uh, them being used as uh, camouflage for some insects. Uh, there's the lacewing larva here. And then also, you can see in the bottom right, the uh, English pepper moth uh, using uh, its coloration to camouflage with the lichens on the tree. So the status of lichens in Kentucky, <clears throat> this is something that I'm working on um, and I've been working on with Dr. Alan Risk uh, for several years. Um, right now, uh, this is actually needs to be updated a little bit. So this was, uh, these are numbers from 2020 and those numbers continue to change, but I'll go ahead and Go with this right now that there are 618 species of lichens in Kentucky, uh, one globally, globally rare and 60 to be state listed. That number has gone up um, and I'm actually working on analyzing the data to um, really figure out where all of our <clears throat> lichen uh, species stand within Kentucky. So I'm partnering with NatureServe and using their ranking calculator and their ranking tools uh, to uh, really better evaluate uh, the species that we have. So this also could be updated, but uh, this is the map that I have right now. We've acquired a lot more information um, since then, <clears throat> but just to give you an idea of how lichens in Kentucky, um, where they were and where we're going um, in 2017, when we started, you know, this Lichens of Kentucky project. Um, so this is when I started, I just graduated college. I just started at Nature Preserves and this is the state of things. Um, so you can see, uh, you know, observations per county. And there are several counties here that are completely white in 2017 who had no official uh, lichen observations that I could pull from, um, you know, so, we had a lot of work to do because um, obviously there are lichens in all of these counties. Um, they're just so understudied that uh, this was the state of things. So through you know my travels, uh, I've utilized iNaturalist projects. Um, I get people to take photos and collect specimens for me. Um, so by 2019, uh, we had gotten here. Uh, so a lot more counties have uh, you know, collections that never had any before, and um, a, 
almost all of the counties increased uh, their collections and observations. Um, now it's probably even more blue than it was in 2019. And hopefully, I hope sometime in 2022 to be able to completely update uh, this map uh, to reflect what we know now. Um, so lots of work is going into it. And um, it seems to be great that, you know, things like this, people are interested in hearing about lichens more and more at the time where I am trying to figure them out in Kentucky. Um, so sometimes the stars align. Uh, so you guys uh, are seeing right here, we're at the infancy of this uh, research and science kind of in Kentucky. Um, and I hope to be able to update you guys more and more um, throughout the years. So I know I just covered a lot. Uh, that was our last uh, section. So if there are any um, questions about anything we've talked about or the section we just went over, um, I'm, I'm ready to answer them all. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And what a fantastic presentation. Um, we do have some questions. And so I encourage anyone else that has questions for our speaker today to put those in the Q&A or in the chat. So one of those questions is, are any lichens parasitic or harmful to their substrate? Like from a human perspective, perhaps. Um, I mean, I think if you're a rock um, with a bunch of crustos lichens on, on you, um, within you know a couple of decades or a couple of centuries, you probably should be worried. Um, but besides that, um, besides lichens being parasitic upon one another, which happens very occasionally, um, yeah, not really parasitic uh, in any kind of human context at all. Excellent. Um, I get that question a lot with trees, you know, are they hurting people's trees? And uh, it's always nice to be able to be like, no, but if you have a lot of lichens in your tree, something to think about. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, can the fungi and lichens grow and reproduce without the algae or cyanobacteria? So, um, no, because to have a lichen, you have to have both the fungi and the algae. Um, and those two, you know, those are completely separate species and organisms. Um, so they can live independently of one another, but they cannot, you know, be called that lichen species unless they are growing together in this symbiotic relationship. Um, so yeah, without the algal component or without the fungal component, it's, it's just a standalone, completely different species. But you can find some of those fungi independent of, of that, correct? Absolutely. You can find both the fungi and the algae completely independent of the lichen that they may, you know, be um, a part of. Isn't that, they're such interesting organisms. Um, the question is, climate change likely to affect lichens much? Absolutely. Um, lichens are super sensitive to environmental changes. Um, so if, you know, the water, the rain regimen, the fog regimen um, were to change um, in an area that would, um, it could help the lichen, it could hurt it. Um, it just depends, you know, is it, is the climate changing in favor or against? Um, and it's probably pretty um, species dependent and some species are more sensitive than others. So yeah, I think there will be a lot of effects. We definitely see effects with more um, of how they concentrate air pollutants. Um, so yeah, it's definitely going to have an effect, but more research needs to uh, be done and I'm sure is being done at the moment. Great. We have a comment um, from someone who read a paper that had shown that contrary to what was commonly believed, wolf lichen contain up to three different fungi. And uh, so kind of wanting to know some more about that, I know that some of what we know in terms of those different players is changing. And uh, wanting to know, has there been any similar research findings with native Kentucky species? So um, 
<clears throat> like I mentioned before, like systematic genetic testing and understanding of lichens didn't really start until 2016. So we still kind of are in the infancy um, of that kind of science. And within, you know, since the time that I started looking at lichens, you know, six, seven years ago, it seems that there are a lot of discoveries um, about what could really be the components. Um, and there seems to be a lot of disagreements at the moment between scientists. Um, so I'm not a geneticist. Um, I, don't, I don't dwell in, in that kind of realm too much. So I'm gonna let brighter minds um, figure that out. So until there's more of a unified consensus among the lichenologist community, um, I'm just kind of waiting and listening um, for, for uh, that, that answer from everybody. So right now I'm just kind of sticking with what was uh, more universally accepted until the last few years. Uh, because if I, if I teach the latest and greatest about what has come out within six months, eight months, a year, it, there's gonna be another group that's gonna say something different. Um, so I'm just kind of waiting for people who are more qualified to answer that question, um, to provide that to the public. Yeah, fungal genetics is tricky and taxonomy is, is so complicated um, and in such a state of disarray right now because everything that we use, you know, the whole system um, for many organisms, you know, the genetic information, it might have changed things a little bit, but, you know, in, in general, we kind of knew where things stood. With fungi, it is a mess. And then lichens, you know, it's like a, a mess times times two, I'm sure. So um, uh, we'll yeah. all stay tuned for more information. <laughs> yes, it's great to stay on top of the subject. And I think the research is brilliant. And I can't wait for everyone to finally figure it out and agree. Um, but yeah, definitely something that is interesting and cutting edge science to uh, keep your eye out for. Great, um, we have a question. Any current or future biomimicry um, based on like in life, life cycle uh, in things like medicine or engineering? Are, are lichens being used in any of those fields to kind of advance things? Uh, yes, that is also not an area that I am super knowledgeable about. I know that they are being used. They have, you know, certain species have medicinal properties um, and uh, can be studied for all kinds of things. Um, that's not super like what I, I do and what I'm knowledgeable about, but um, I can definitely send some resources um, out to the group uh, to provide some information on that. Great. Love it. And um, we had two questions about this. Uh, so, and or actually maybe three, um, I think your presentation really got people excited. So wanting to know, how can they help? How can they help with um, uh, maybe adding to the lichen survey in counties? Could this be a citizen science project for master naturalist? Are lichens used to determine air quality in Kentucky and how can people help with that? Um, so, so how can they help? All right, y'all, y'all gonna get me so excited. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, if anyone is familiar with iNaturalist, iNaturalist has helped me so much. I am but one person with two feet and I have a lot of other, you know, duties and I uh, could really use boots on the ground, people taking pictures of what they see um, and putting them on Night Naturalist. I have a project and if you post any uh, lichen and just label it as just simply lichen even, um, and it's in, within the state of Kentucky, it will automatically be pulled into my project and mostly in the winter time when I'm not super busy doing field work, I go through those observations and try to help ID them. And then I use those observations um, to help update these, uh, you know, these county maps and these observation maps that I have to see where we are within the state of Kentucky. So that's the easiest way you can get involved. Um, and I can uh, send some links out in, uh, for that, if anyone is interested, um, I am also. I have people who send me uh, emails, um, 
and messages with photos of lichens. Um, I am always up for that. You can collect specimens for me. Um, unless you are in the mountains uh, of Kentucky, then please do not collect anything because um, those lichens are extra sensitive and um, more rare generally than the rest of the lichens in the state. Um, just take lots of photos. Um, lichen air quality monitoring. There's actually some really simple things you guys can do. Um, I just did a, uh, a lichen air quality monitoring uh, workshop with uh, the 4-H, um, oh, I forgot your guys' name. It's the Natural Resources and Environmental Science Academy, and it was awesome. <laughs> Yes, um, so I did that with uh, their, their amazing middle schoolers. Oh, they were great. Um, but we did this activity where it's, it's so simple. You just go out to a tree and there's a template uh, that's a transparency um, sheet that you put over the tree and you document what kinds of lichens um, are behind these certain circles um, that are placed on the transparency sheet. And then, you know, you analyze that and write it down. And it's, it's you know, kind of basic science, but it really makes sense. Um, so if a tree has all crustose lichens or no lichens, um, the air quality in the area is going to generally be poorer than if it is covered in fruticose and foliose lichens. And that's just simply because of surface area. Um, so fruticose and foliose lichens have a lot more surface area, and therefore, if there are pollutants in the air, they are going to absorb them a lot more than a crustose lichen would, um, just because there's more surface for the air to touch and therefore pollutants to get in, and they will concentrate more pollutants and therefore not be able to survive in that area. So literally just documenting on a tree the different growth forms and their abundance um, can easily be correlated into the um, air quality of the area. And I can send um, that uh, lesson out to everybody in those resources. Uh, it's super simple um, kind of stuff, and, but it's really a great way to get stuff, you know, get lichen info and understand um, our air quality in Kentucky. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I can already see we need to have a field day to do some lichen surveying with you maybe next year. So absolutely. Oh, I would be delighted. It's it's a great one. Yeah, definitely. We should do this in person. I love it. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Okay, good. We will reach out to you about that. And your we put your um email in the chat. So if you Excellent. have any questions for Kendall, you know, now you know how to reach out to her and engage her in your programming that you might be doing, or as a citizen scientist, you know, some of these projects would be uh, really fun and easy to conduct in natural areas near you. Um, I know I use iNaturalist all the time. It's always on my phone. And so this is something that's really accessible. Okay, so before we go, and a big thank you to Kendall for this fantastic presentation today. We really appreciate you talking with our group. But before we go, I have one other thing that I wanna share with everyone. And that is, we have a fantastic field day coming up on September 15th, um, the Cook Wild Field Day that's gonna be at Robinson Forest. Um, in Clay Hole, Kentucky. And if you haven't been to Robinson Forest, it's worth it to visit Robinson Forest all on its own because it's a cool location. Um, but uh, it's going to be a wonderful day that's filled with all sorts of different things. Um, whether it's uh, wildlife and getting a lesson on wildlife, uh, animal tracks, pelts, trapping, um, talking about stream ecology, getting to sample several recipes. So not only do you get to go, but there's going to be lunch, there's going to be uh, recipes to try. Um, uh, you know, it's just going to be a fantastic day. And you can see here, it's led by a range of different specialists who all have great expertise in their subject area, whether that is wildlife, whether that is cook wild and uh, using that wildlife in some delicious ways. 
um, and um, all sorts of other things. And I believe that Martha uh, Yant is here with us right now and she can answer any of your questions if you wanna put them in the chat about that day. Um, and uh, so I really encourage you, if you haven't already and you're interested, um, call this number that'll get you Renee Williams and she will get you all signed up for that. It will be a fun day, right, Martha? And here, I can make you a co-host really quick so you could share any other information you have on that. Um, but uh, really looking forward to that. Any, any other announcements or things folks want to share? We have lots of thank yous to you, Kendall. Um, you know, people learned a lot. I think you're going to get some excited um, future participants in your programs um, to help advance what we know about lichens in the state. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, is there a way I could um, get an email list um, for the naturalist and I can send some resources out after this? Definitely. About? Mm -hmm. Definitely. That Yay, okay, great. good. I'll send you guys some things soon then. Great. And uh, Martha, I believe you're a panelist now. So if you have anything you'd like to share about the September 15th Cook Wild Field Day, now is your time. Thanks, Ellen. So uh, the, the sign up is available for that. Now, even if you're not real sure about eating wild game, your, your lunch will be provided by Neva at the forest uh, uh, sack lunch. But we're going to have several recipes for you to taste. And uh, Matt Stringer and um, Stacy White will be there with the wildlife part. And Stacy has a fabulous collection of pelts. He's a very accomplished trapper. And um, Ashley Osborne will be there leading our creek discovery. So we'll get to actually get in the creek and learn some about the macroinvertebrates there. But really our main point for the master naturalist is to encourage you to come to Robinson Forest and see how then you might plan activities for your groups in the future. So this day will just be a little, uh, um, a little teaser and you'll get to, to see a few things, but the main point is that you'll get to learn how you can bring your own group back to Robinson Forest and take advantage of that great educational space. Plus it's gorgeous. So we hope that you'll come and visit us. It is a little complicated to get to, but it is worth the drive. I agree. I agree. So uh, don't don't let that put you off. It'll be a really fun day. Yeah. And, and thank you, Martha and Jan, for putting it together. Yeah. It was, and here you guys are a master naturalist and you're doing your own scheduling your own field days. Yeah. We appreciate it very much. Definitely. All right. Well, well, wonderful to see everyone. Thanks for joining today. And we hope to see you for a field day soon. Um, and do help us share the word about the fall program if you know anybody who'd like to join, um, you know, for our new fall cohort. Um, so, so nice to see everyone this morning and have a great rest of your day.